uh, thanks everybody for coming back and joining us. But let me hand off the floor to Melissa Stang. Melissa is a professor of computer science at uh, Lord Fairfax Community College. She runs the CS program there and she is gonna, she linked us up with Gary for this great keynote opportunity. And I'm gonna let Dr. Melissa Stang introduce Gary. So thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Dave. So Dr. Gary McGraw got his first computer, which was an Apple, at the age of 15. Four years later, he got on the public net when few had even heard of the internet. He also wrote the 10th chapter of the first book ever sold on Amazon, Fluid Concepts of Creative Analogy, Computer Models for the Fundamentals of Mechanisms of Thought. Gary is also a multi-instrument musician who twice played his violin at Carnegie Hall. He holds a PhD in cognitive science and computer science from Indiana University and a bachelor's degree in philosophy from the University of Virginia. One of Lord Fairfax's community college students who attended a tech bite session described him as a technology god who still cares about the novice and can explain complex concepts in understandable terms. A Frederick County Public Schools cybersecurity educator commented that after hearing him speak, she now understands that cybersecurity is a risk management exercise. Howard Smith, a former White House cybersecurity advisor, described Gary's advice as straightforward as it is actionable. You can also catch Gary during today's 4.30 virtual happy hour demonstrating his mythology skills with an algorithmic approach. It's my honor to introduce the co-founder of Fairyville Institute of Machine Learning, aka Bimmel, and one of my mentors, Gary McGraw. Well, thank you, Melissa. That was a nice intro. I'm always surprised to hear about myself that way. Let me share my screen and get my slides up. There we go. So I want to talk today about security engineering for machine learning. And since I know a lot of people on this call are educators, um, I want to start with a pretty gentle introduction to machine learning so that we're all kind of on the same page. And then I'm going to talk about some work we're doing at BIML. Um, which Melissa said properly is the Berryville Institute for Machine Learning um, that convenes in my kitchen by the Shenandoah River. Uh, and today I'm going to be focusing on uh, risk analysis results from some work we've been doing over the last year and a half. And I want to, in the end of this talk, spend a fair amount of time um, discussing in depth five of the 78 risks that we've identified um, so that you get some idea of some of the challenges we're facing at the very edge of technology as we adopt artificial intelligence and machine learning technology. So a little bit of about myself, Melissa mentioned at least two of the three of these things. She mentioned that I'm a a technologist, that's me at RSA with a lightsaber um, <laughs> from some vendor's booth. Um, and I'm a violinist, that's me playing the violin at a Bitter Liberals concert, I believe at the Bright Box in Winchester, Virginia. And then I have the occasional really small bonfire for the solstice. Um, so uh, I, I just wanted to say as, a, as an introduction, I spent 25 years as a technologist in a Virginia-based company called originally Reliable Software Technologies and then called Sigital. We sold that company to a Silicon Valley firm in 2016 and I retired shortly thereafter. Um, we had about 500 people and though we were based in Virginia, we had 19 offices around the world. So my background is really in software security which is a field that I helped to found. I wrote a bunch of books in software security, including the first one in the world called Building Secure Software. And when I retired, I thought, you know, I'm hearing an awful lot about artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I wonder as a practicing technologist, how much is this is hype and how much is true and what's the real state of the world in uh, machine learning? And so, 
based on that idea, um, I got a couple of friends and we started reading the literature and talking about particular papers. And it turns out that we learned a lot about um, machine learning pretty quickly. And one of the things that we were fast to find out was that not many people were thinking about the risks of machine learning. That is the security of the machine learning stuff itself. So today I'm gonna to talk about the confluence of the philosophy of building security in or software security as I like to call it and machine learning or artificial intelligence. And basically what we've done at BIML is to um, intersect these fields and find out how well machine learning stands up to security scrutiny at the design level. So I'll be talking about what machine learning can do now, but I'll also be talking about some of the dangers of just willy nilly adopting machine learning. I know that there was one question that was submitted in advance to Melissa who kindly shared it with me asking about the cow on this picture right here. Um, that cow is to represent Clark County where there are slightly more cows than people, I think. And if you know your shapes of Virginia counties, you might notice that the glob in the middle of that cow is actually Clark County. <laughs> that was a, a logo designed by my daughter, Jackie. So let's start with an introduction to machine learning. Um, the first thing we need to do is think a little bit about history. Artificial intelligence has been around for a long time, um, as has machine learning. And even what we are now calling deep learning has been around for quite a long time, back into the 80s. Um, I'm borrowing some slides with permission from Melanie Mitchell, who gave us a, a really great talk at Lord Fairfax Community College recently, and use these slides to show kind of how artificial intelligence and machine learning and deep learning have evolved over the years. What I want to say about this is, you know, logic-based symbolic AI came first. Then we had mostly statistical models that were still mostly symbolic using things like the Bayes rule. Then something called perceptrons got invented to mimic the brain. And neural networks became more sophisticated deep networks, deep learning networks were invented. And all that happened in the 50s, but most of the 50s to the 80s, but most of the work um, in AI wasn't machine learning. So there was a lot of artificial intelligence research and a lot of results that were talked about that really didn't have anything to do with neural networks the way we're going to talk about today. That changed around the 1990s where uh, machine learning began to take up a greater portion, slightly more than half of, of AI, though deep learning was still a pretty small um, part of the field. Now, um, really starting around 10 years ago, artificial intelligence is dominated by deep learning. And in fact, in the popular press and in a lot of the kind of things that you'll probably come across as educators, and your students will come across, um, there is this way of equating artificial intelligence to deep learning. It's important to note, however, that they're not really the same thing. Um, and deep learning is a pretty new way of approaching uh, neural network stuff. So let's talk about what deep learning means and what machine learning means today in 2020. One way to do that is to kind of compare uh, a neural network to an actual neural network. So a convolutional neural network is something we build on a computer as a simulation and we train it up with a lot of data to do a task. But there's a real neural network in everybody's heads in your brain. And so here is a very sort of classic picture processing model inspired by the brain. And you can see that, you know, a, a a picture comes in through the retina and it goes through edge detections and simple shape detections and complex shapes. Basically representation gets built up and then 
you can recognize faces and objects. That's the way things work in the brain. And the idea behind convolutional neural networks or machine learning technologies is to try to, to do the same thing. Of course, what we're doing is way, 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 way more simple than a brain is. But believe it or not, because computers are so powerful and computation is getting so much cheaper and data sets are getting really, really large, the number of things that we can do with a machine learning algorithm today in 2020 that even 10 years ago seemed like fantasy is absolutely surprising. Uh, it's exciting, it's worrisome, and it's a lot of fun to think about what we can do with these simple convolutional neural networks that have lots and lots of layers. But basically you can think of the architecture as some input comes in, it flows through a bunch of layers, and then some output comes out the other end. Sometimes they loop back into themselves in a recurrent way, but not always. And even a speed forward network um, can do things that are surprisingly sophisticated without any recurrence or dynamical system stuff. So what we see now is with um, networks like what's called GPT-3, a recently released network from OpenAI um, that has something like, I think it's 128 billion connections between these layers and the neurons in these layers. Um, that kind of network can do some incredibly sophisticated natural language processing. And in fact, one of the fun things that you can do is to look up GPT-3 from OpenAI and play around with it. You can actually have a conversation with this network or what seems to you to be a conversation. And the network is just predicting um, what its next output ought to be based on huge amounts of training. That network, just to put things in perspective, cost about $12.5 million to build, um, which is really not that much money um, when it comes to high tech stuff and the next generation of stuff, but it is certainly not free. And I think that, you know, if we spent that on our education budget, we might be getting somewhere as well. <laughs> so that is a very basic introduction to how artificial intelligence and machine learning and convolutional neural networks and deep learning are related to each other. As I said before, one of the things that I did when I retired is start thinking about machine learning deeply and reading the literature and trying to figure out what was going on at the edge of science. And it became really clear that though there are a lot of different particular models for machine learning that do things as varied as play Atari video games or play chess better than grandmasters or even play Go better than grandmasters um, who can converse with us, who do all the natural language processing behind Alexa and Siri. Um, all of these models share a number of common components. And so for our work, in order to really understand how this stuff gets put together and what the parts are, we built a generic machine learning model. And here's a picture of it. It has nine basic components. There are both processes and collections of stuff in this model. The processes are represented as ovals and the collections of stuff like data sets are, are represented as rectangles. And arrows represent the information flow through the model. So you can see that if you start with raw data in the world, then you have to assemble that into a data set and you use those data sets to train and validate and then test a learning algorithm, which is then evaluated and eventually gets promoted to be a running model that gets other inputs, has an inference algorithm and produces outputs. Really, if you think about it, if you boil it way down, what you've got is an input output model with some stuff in the middle. And the stuff in the middle is not programmed in by people one idea at a time or one inference at a time or one if then statement at a time, but rather 
emerges as a distributed representation across uh, an input field where maybe you just represent a picture as a bunch of dots, as picture as pixels, and then those pixels get assembled and you know, you say, if you see these pixels, there's a dog in that picture. And you do that millions of times adjusting the weights. And that's how machine learning algorithms get trained. So um, instead of focusing too much more attention on these algorithms, what I thought I would do is give you an introduction to some of the risks that we are identifying in these very models themselves. I do want to make one important distinction. There are a lot of people who are using machine learning algorithms to do security. So they're doing security with machine learning. Um, so their security mechanisms are machine learning mechanisms. What we're doing at BIML is distinct from that. We're more interested in the security of machine learning than using machine learning for security. I hope that distinction makes sense. Because if you think about it, one of the tricky things about doing machine learning for security <clears throat> is that if your machine learning algorithm itself introduces more risk than it's handling in some other capacities acting as, say, a security feature or function, then you might have some trouble. It turns out that machine learning introduces more problems than it solves in that case. And so for me, when you're faced with the chicken and egg problem of security and machine learning, the chicken to focus on, or maybe the egg, I'm not really sure, is the security of machine learning itself. So if we take these nine components here in our generic machine learning model, and we think about risks at the architectural level, what do we find out? By the way, this is work that we published at BIML um, that is free under the Creative Commons and that you can download from our website, berryvilleiml.com. Um, if you go under results, you can just very simply grab a copy of our paper. It's kind of long um, and it has a lot of information on it but thousands of people have already read it. And like all of the work that I've been doing over the last few years, I think that putting this stuff out under the Creative Commons um, for anybody to download and use as they see fit, not for commercial purposes, um, is a very useful way to get information out into the world. Um, just so you know, I'm a published scientist and I've done a lot of peer reviewed writing and peer reviewed publications written a whole bunch of books. But what I've found in my later career is when I put stuff out under the Creative Commons and talk about it in forums like this, I get much more exposure and much more, um, I don't know, resonance with the ideas than if they're just published in some obscure IEEE journal. And so I would encourage you all to think about the Creative Commons as a way to publish your own work. So let's focus on those nine components and then finally add on the system as a whole and identify some risks that you might find um, in these components and in machine learning. I guess the number one thing to think about when it comes to security and machine learning is what constitutes the model itself. It turns out that data play a really crucial role in machine learning systems. And in fact, data are so important that in my view, they're the most important aspect of machine learning security. That's because what's being learned is the data. So if you have really crappy data and it goes in and your system learns everything there is to learn about those data, it's gonna learn some crappy stuff. Uh, for example, we know that there are problems now in some fielded machine learning systems with racism and sexism and xenophobia. And that's because these machine learning algorithms have been trained up on data that reflects bad aspects of our society, where women are not treated equally, where people are discriminated by the color of their skin, discriminated against 
or where one country thinks it's better than the others. And if we use machine learning systems and train them up on data that has those biases in it, the systems will be biased themselves. So it's really important to focus a fair amount of attention on the data you're using to train up a machine learning algorithm. Um, there are other aspects of data that are really important and a lot of risks are related to data um, in our risk analysis. So when it comes to raw data in the world, I wanna point out two things. One is that a machine learning system that's trained up on confidential data or sensitive data are gonna have aspects of those data built right into it which is really kind of a surprising thing. Um, it's really important to note that if you train up a machine learning model, the machine learning model learns a lot of things that may be secret or may be protected. Uh, and you have to do a fair amount of thinking to try to protect that stuff from being extracted later. The number two risk that, that uh, I wanna point out here because data is so important is that data sources have to be trustworthy and suitable and reliable. If you have an attacker that can tamper with or otherwise poison your raw input data, what happens if the input gets changed by an attacker on purpose and your machine learning system goes off the rails immediately? That's a really critical aspect of machine learning that makes it different from other systems in security that we think about. So that is kind of two simple examples of risks that are associated with the first component, raw data in the world. And it turns out that there are 11 more risks of that sort in our paper. Now, let me move on to the next slide. Um, raw data themselves don't get, uh, are not in an appropriate format for all machine learning systems. And so you have to do a lot of pre-processing in order to get those data into your system. And so data set assembly is really about that. And if you think about it, when you're pre-processing your data, one question you have to consider is, does the pre-processing step itself introduce security problems? You know, are there bias in the raw data processing that throw out data that really should be included um, because it's in some sense anomalous? Or, or, or not, how does that all work? And these are things you have to think about when you build a machine learning system, which is why we're doing this work. Finally, the way da data are kind of tagged or and bagged or annotated into features can also be directly attacked. Um, and an attacker that's very clever can use this kind of data set assembly and raw data in the world together to make sure that your machine learning system doesn't generalize well or that you know the machine learning system just doesn't even work. Really, you know what's surprising, and I think it, it's surprising to a lot of people who start building these models for themselves, is most of the human engineering that goes into machine learning is spent cleaning and deleting and aggregating and organizing and just all out manipulating data so that it can be consumed by a machine learning algorithm. So a lot of the work in the pre-processing step is done by people. Those are two of the eight risks associated with data set assembly. Next comes data that are grouped into training, validation, and test sets. This partitioning is very tricky and it's really important because it hugely impacts the future behavior of a machine learning system. Um, what happens is you use some data to train your system millions of times. You know, you, you adjust it each time it gets something wrong. Um, so you change it in order to make the thing represent the problem the way you want it to be represented. And then you got to make sure that it actually works properly. And so that's what your validation set for is for. And finally, there's a test set that's even wider. Um, that is the rest of the stuff in the world. And so dividing uh, data into these sets is a very tricky business. And all three components in our generic model, you know, raw data in the world and data set assembly and data sets are subject to poisoning attacks where an attacker might intentionally manipulate data 
in any of the three first components and possibly cause the machine learning system to go awry. Let me tell you, Microsoft thought it would be really cool to have a Twitter bot, which they called Tay, um, be learn, learn to interact with Twitter uh, on machine learning, uh, using machine learning algorithms. And you know what happened? <laughs> Almost immediately, Tay learned to be a troll, a racist, bigoted, xenophobic, little horrible thing, like your worst student of all that you've ever had. Just absolutely horrible. It was so bad, um, Tay learned to be so heinous that they just turned it off. And that's because the data that was being used to train Tay was filled with all sorts of horrible trolly stuff. And Tay learned to imitate those trolls. So, you know, machine learning is a hammer and you can use the hammer to do some bad things. You can create bad machine learning systems, even unintentionally because of the way they learn. The learning algorithm is the technical heart of machine learning, but really there's less security risk in these learning algorithms than there is in the data. You know, one thing to think about is whether your learning algorithm is always learning. Many machine learning systems work by training them up and then you stop learning and you ship that trained system. Others work differently where they keep on learning even when they're out there in the world and obviously, if you have a system that's still learning while it's being fielded and interacting with potential attackers, you have a security risk because uh, it may be intentionally forced to drift from its intended operational use case by a clever attacker who nudges it in the wrong direction on purpose. And over time, it gets wronger and wronger. Um, so that's an example of a learning algorithm risk of online systems. And there are nine more of these in the paper, so 11 all told. Next comes evaluation. And evaluation is supposed to ask, when am I done training? Like if I'm training this thing up and I'm showing it pictures and saying that's a dog, that's a cat, that's a wolf, how do I know when it's done? And how good is the trained model? That's what the evaluation step is for. And if you have a bad evaluation data set that doesn't reflect the data, it, the machine learning system will see in production, you can mislead a scientist into thinking everything's working fine even when it's not because the evaluation data makes people think everything's hunky-dory even when they're not. So picking really good evaluation data and really understanding how your machine learning system works is tricky and in fact, it's an often slightly overlooked task because you're so psyched that you got your thing working at all that you don't really pay too much attention on whether it's always right or, whether, or how it's even doing what it's doing. In fact, one of the problems with machine learning kind of writ large is we build these systems and they kind of sort of work, but we're not really sure why. We just say, well, it's a whole bunch of connections and a whole bunch of network, neural network, Neural, neuron models that are connected to each other and information flows through there, but we're not really sure how the thing actually works, um, which is tricky if it's doing stuff like, imagine a neural network is deciding whether you're gonna get a bank loan and it makes decisions that it's been trained to make and it says, nope, that person's not supposed to get a bank loan, but then you wonder why well, the question about why a machine learning system does what it does is still something that we don't often have very good answers for. And that's something we have to think about as we adopt this technology. Finally, if we field a system, we have the same sort of input coming into the system that we might have used to train it. So what input is fed to the trained model during production and where does the, that input come from? Very similar to you know, the data set assembly risk we talked about a minute ago. But this is where um, one of the most important kinds of attacks that you've probably heard about in the press um, arises in machine learning. There's something called adversarial examples that 
uh, machine learning is susceptible to. And here's why. So if you train up your system and it can say distinguish, I don't know, cats and tanks, um, and you're not really sure how it's representing cats or tanks, it just says that's a cat and that's a tank, then a clever attacker who figures out how the representation is actually working can tweak the input in ways that humans might not even be able to see and cause the machine learning system to do the wrong thing. So if you've heard of the machine learning system that was trained to recognize stop signs, seeing stop signs as speed limit 45 signs and being wrong about that, that is an example of adversarial examples. Most of the popular press about machine learning security has been dedicated to adversarial examples, which are a really important category of malicious input. But they're also really overhyped because in our work, we've identified 78 risks and this is one of the 78. Um, and so, you know, even though it's super sexy and fun to talk about those risks and it makes a great example for the classroom, um, it's important not to put all our security eggs in one basket and say, well, if we just handle adversarial examples, we'll be done because that's really not true. Another component in, our, in, in uh, the machine learning generic model is the model itself. So risks associated with a model that you field out there in the world. We say our machine learning algorithm is done and now we're gonna use it to recognize speech out there in the world. In fact, we're gonna make it into our customer service representative. So, you know, there are all sorts of risks here that are, that are really interesting. One of the most interesting is that machine learning is so expensive computationally training something up, like I told you GPT-3 costs 12 and a half million bucks to train up, that a lot of people start with a, a model that's already trained to do something and they reuse that model and they train it to do something more. So transfer learning is an important uh, technique in machine learning and it's something that can be uh, attacked, that can be taken advantage of by an attacker. So either improperly reusing, uh, transferring the wrong thing, or you know, um, maybe even having a model that you train up that has a Trojan capability or backdoors built into it are real risks that a lot of people are writing about in the scientific literature. Then there's the inference algorithm itself, you know, the thing that decides, oh, that's a cat or that's a tank. And of course, you know, there are some risks associated with those fielded models. I already told you some aspects of what happens when you have one of these things learning online. But another thing that I've mentioned and I wanna underline here is that in many cases, in far too many cases, a machine learning system is fielded without really understanding how it works or why it does what it does. And integrating an ML system that sort of just works into a larger system that then relies on the machine learning system to, per to perform properly all the time is a huge risk. So if you over rely on a machine learning system that you don't understand very well because it's very tricky and complicated and involves a lot of heavy math, then um, you run the risk of building a system that you don't understand that turns out to be wrong in cases that you don't want it to be wrong. Finally, there's some pretty simple risks associated with output, which is the, often the whole point. You know, you want the thing to say dog or wolf or whatever. Um, and directly attacking the output is pretty obvious. So if an attacker can tweak the output stream directly, that'll impact the larger system in which the machine learning subsystem is put in. And there are many ways to do that kind of thing, kind of interpositioning uh, what's called person in the middle attacks can be done at the output layer. So these are some technical risks that we spent a lot of time identifying in our work at the Berryville Institute of Machine Learning. And I wanted to give you a feel for kind of those technical risks. Um, we also had some that were associated not with a particular component, 
but kind of getting over and above the component view. And these sorts of risks happen between or across components. There are 10 of those. One is um, overconfidence, which I sort of alluded to in a minute ago. When a system with a particular error behavior is integrated into a larger system and its output is treated as high confidence stuff, even though it might not be that confident as, as a subsystem, users of the system may put too much uh, emphasis on the machine learning part being always right or being magical or being, you know, uh, incapable of being incorrect or even failing in a non catastrophic way. Unfortunately, placing too much confidence in machine learning um, because it seems to be working is a real risk. And we've seen that uh, in fielded systems uh, multiple times. So there are 78 of these risks that we identified. And I know that's way too many for you to keep in your head. And so what I thought I would do is spend a little bit of time talking about the top five machine learning risks and giving you some examples of the top five risks in a way that you might be able to reuse in a classroom when you're talking about machine learning and you wanna get across to students what um, advanced technical risks look like. I already discussed adversarial examples a little bit when we were talking about the components, but this is probably the most commonly discussed attack. Um, and the idea is to fool a machine learning system by providing malicious input where you tweak the input just a little. Maybe you overlay some sort of a filter over the input that causes the system to make a false categorization or prediction. Um, and so one example is you see that school bus right there. There's a school bus in the upper left and then in the middle is a uh, overlay that you put on top of the school bus. And then the thing with the overlay still looks like a school bus to human beings. See where it says school bus backwards the same way. The problem is that if you present that to a particular machine learning system, it'll say it's a Jaguar. In fact, it says all of these things are a Jaguar. And you know, it's pretty clear to a human that we have a Mayan temple and a grouse uh, or some kind of bird there. And, you know, they don't really look like jaguars, but because adversarial examples really get to the edges of what kind of representation is going on inside a machine learning system, you can have these surprising results come out. So, you know, a lot of attention has been paid to these adversarial examples. And it's important because it's helping people realize that machine learning is not perfect but it's swamping out all the other important machine learning risks too. Um, I do wanna say that adversarial examples are very much real and they're very much important, um, but we can't just you know, handle only that. The second big risk out of our top five is the risk of data poisoning. As I mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, data play a huge role in the security of machine learning system because the data is what teaches the machine learning system how to do what it does. So if an attacker can intentionally manipulate data being used by a machine learning system in a coordinated way, the entire system can be compromised. You know, uh, think about maybe a way of blinding a sensor in an automated car that's supposed to be self-driving. And you know, the machine learning algorithm is counting on the sensor to correctly report information about, I don't know, light intensity, but instead it's getting a laser pointed at it. Then what? What happens to the machine learning system when it gets data that it's not expecting? Or those data that it's sampling out of the real world are being controlled by an attacker. When you design a system like an automated car uh, uh, that drives itself, a self-driving car system, you have to think about what happens when bad people intentionally do things like overload your sensors. And I know that this is very distressing to think about these things, but that's what I've been doing for 25 years is thinking about how systems can go wrong. And unfortunately, machine learning systems can go wrong in new and surprising ways that are 
kind of related, but not entirely related to what we've been thinking about in cybersecurity for many, many years. Data poisoning attacks require special attention and thinking about what fraction of say training data an attacker can control and what control they can wield over your data is really, really very important. You might be familiar with some old crypto based attacks, which, you know, take a similar view where if an attacker can anticipate that the search space you're using is just your process table or packet arrival time, and they can tweak those values by either overloading your computer with a bunch of spurious processes or giving you a DDoS attack so you're not getting packets in the right order, then the attacker can really screw up your, say, entropy pool randomness uh, selection and really make your crypto go down. That's the sort of thing that now can be applied to machine learning in terms of poisoning attacks. So it's something that we're familiar with, but it's also something that has a new spin because of machine learning. So that's number two, data poisoning. Number three, I talked about a little bit already, online system manipulation, where a machine learning system that's online continues to learn while it's in operational use. So it's still learning, and if you can nudge it in this, the wrong direction while it's still learning, you can retrain it um, to go from pretty good over here to way wrong and then even back. Um, and so it's a very complex demanding, you know, risk that, that, that makes engineers think about all sorts of things together. Like where did, where, where did your data come from? What algorithm is right? How do I set the parameters on the algorithm so that one piece of bad data can't overload everything? And how do I operate a machine learning system that's still learning in a secure fashion in order to address this risk? Um, just another example of a very important category uh, of, of risk in machine learning that doesn't really show up in other sorts of systems. Transfer learning I also briefly touched on and you know, I mentioned that because machine learning is so expensive, we often construct a new system by taking an already trained base model and then fine tuning it. So we might have a model that say recognizes circles and it can tell a circle from a square, but we wanna train it to be an oval recognizer. So we wanna um, put a finer point on it and have it, have it do ovals instead of circles. If we start with the circle recognizer, we, it'll be cheaper to train the thing to be an oval recognizer. That's an example of transfer. And a data transfer attack might take place when the base system is compromised or the base system is the wrong base system picked by the wrong people for the wrong reasons or by building in some unanticipated behavior that an attacker put in there as a Trojan horse or a backdoor. Unfortunately, the uh, machine learning literature, people are using the term backdoor to describe this Trojan functionality, which is a little bit tricky, but you know, all of you familiar with cybersecurity know that one of the hardest parts about cybersecurity is nomenclature. Everybody uses slightly different terminology for the same things, and it's very hard to keep all that stuff apart. Um, anyway, data transfer attacks are very real. And if you think about, say, the GPT-3 model, which is now out there for use by people, you can get the API and you can use that model and you can leverage that model in your own work um, if you get the, the OpenAI people uh, to give you access to their model, which is a very great way to get a head start because the model knows an awful lot and it's been trained on billions and billions of things for billions of cycles. Um, a lot at $12.5 million worth of training. And if you can reuse that, that means that with a much cheaper budget, you can do some really cool machine learning stuff. Um, but then you got to think about this transfer learning problem. The last risk I want to talk about before I wrap things up and open things up for questions is data confidentiality. You know, I mentioned this at the very beginning. When we train up a machine learning system, it learns a lot about the data that we're training it on. 
And if we train up a system on, say, classified data or um, super confidential healthcare data or uh, private information like your social security number, um, then those data are in the network itself, in the machine learning system. So protecting data is really hard already. And when you throw ML into the mix and say, uh-oh, every time we train up a machine learning system using these confidential data, that becomes confidential too. We can see that we've got a big can of worms here. So one of the unique challenges in ML is protecting sensitive or confidential information that through training are built right into a model. Uh, this is a thing that the GPT-3 people recognized one generation ago in GPT-2. If you started typing in parts of uh, a social security number, the thing might just complete that for you and give you a valid social security number that belongs to somebody else and even emit their name, which is not something we want a model to do. And in fact, you know, just because it got trained on everything on the internet, it learned a bunch of stuff it probably shouldn't have learned. And that's the trick. We need to know what our system learned. So there are many subtle but very effective ways to extract information out of a machine learning systems data. Uh, and it's a very important category of risk. And when we think about using machine learning, we have to think about data extraction if we use confidential data in building that model. So those are the top five out of our 78 risks that we identified at BIML. And what I thought I would leave you with is a few places to learn more about this work. And then we can open things up for questions. So um, one place to look is the Berryville Institute of Machine Learning's uh, website itself. There's the URL, berryvilleiml.com. Uh, we call it BIML, but we don't own the BIML URL. Uh, I welcome email from you guys, from educators. I'm absolutely psyched about this work and I think it's important and I'd like to help you understand it more deeply. So you're welcome to send me email which I'll probably answer, um, although you'll get some bounces as I'm traveling, probably. <laughs> uh, I hope to be traveling again soon. Um, and then there's my own website where lots of stuff that I've been writing over the last 25 years is available at scarymcgraw.com. Um, and there's my Twitter handle. You can follow me on Twitter and see what I'm doing every day as well. So that's my introduction to um, security for machine learning, how we secure our machine learning systems at the very edge of what's going on in technology and computer science and artificial intelligence. I hope you found that useful. Now let's turn this over to Melissa to ask some questions. Over to you, Melissa. So Gary, one question we have is, what do you think of the movie Ex Machina? <laughs> it was a great movie. Um, you know, I always like thrillers like that. Uh, I think one of the tricky things that we're facing right now is, even if we don't think about um, robots or, you know, embodiment um, as an important aspect of cognition, which my, my son Eli is actually working on that very problem in his cognitive science work right now, um, we still have a propensity to, to uh, map an awful lot of credit into our machine learning system. So we think they're way smarter than they are. We think, wow, that thing knows a lot of stuff. And one of the questions that movies like that um, helps make harder to answer is well, what does it mean to know something? You know, when does something become intelligent and when is it not just a computer program and does embodiment really matter? And what happens if we build something that's as smart or and I love thinking about those problems. So movies like that make me really happy. Okay, and in um, a brief couple sentences, someone would like you to explain what do you think is more important? using ML for security or security on ML? Well, I think I already answered that in my talk. Um, let me describe the difference. 
using machine learning for security would be say trying to categorize spam from normal email using machine learning as a security mechanism. Whereas the security of machine learning is what I've been talking about for the last 45 minutes or so. They're both very important, but my view is if you don't have a handle on securing your ML system, then if you use that ML system that's not secure to do some security stuff, you're asking for it. So obviously the most important thing is what comes first and that is securing your machine learning stuff before you do security stuff with broken machine learning stuff. Great, and we have one other um, <clears throat> question and they wanna know what you recommend to people who, that push AI for all their technology problems. Ah, well, you mean like some, some systems that you can play with. Uh, there are two that come to mind immediately. The first one is called PyTorch, um, which is an open source system that obviously is based on Python that you can download and play around with. And the other one that's used an awful lot in commercial machine learning that you can get access to is called TensorFlow. So those are two systems that I would recommend playing around with. The other thing that I think is kind of really cool to play with, and Melanie Mitchell's been doing this and reporting some of her hilarious results on Twitter this week, is GPT-3. Um, I'm not exactly sure what it takes to get access to the GPT-3 uh, API, but I'm pretty sure that if you were an educator and you contacted OpenAI, they would be really help, you know, super psyched to have you use their stuff in the classroom. And so GPT-3 is another thing that I would look into as a really fun way for kids to get a hands-on experience with AI. However, if you're going to build it, not just use it, then PyTorch or TensorFlow are where I would turn. Okay, one last question. Uh, do you share Musk's optimism for the release of fully autonomous vehicles in the coming year? <laughs> no. Elon Musk is a marketing dude. <laughs> I, I think that we have a lot of problems um, to solve in autonomous systems, especially vehicle control. I think that there's some kind of subsets of that problem that we can do pretty well. Like, you know, driving a truck on an interstate most of the time, we could probably do that with existing technology. The real problem is with corner cases. So when the Tesla car in Arizona killed a biker accidentally, it was because it didn't think a biker should be where that biker was, a bike rider at 2.30 in the morning in the middle of a four lane highway. Um, but it turned out that this kind of slightly deranged homeless person um, on a bike was crossing the, the, the highway in an anomalous way and you know got killed by an autonomous vehicle. So, you know, I think we've made a lot of progress in machine learning and AI, but I don't think we're just about to turn this magical corner and have, you know, AI, strong AI everywhere doing all sorts of stuff, including driving our cars. I think we have a long way to go before we're there. And um, what do you expect the growth of Bibble to be in allowing other researchers to work with you? That's a really good question. So Bimmel started out as two guys and then we doubled all the way to four. So uh, what we've been doing lately is interacting with other researchers that are in other research groups. So for example, uh, Ariel Hunter-Voss is a, a researcher in machine learning at OpenAI who was responsible for security and privacy in GPT-3. And so once we read the GPT-3 release paper, that was a couple hundred pages, we thought, gosh, what better way to learn about machine learning security in GPT-3 than to invite Ariel to participate with us in one of our BIMO meetings? And so she did. Um, and we learned a lot from her and she learned a lot from us. It was a very great, very interesting interaction. And we're beginning to do that with other experts I'm hoping that I can maybe secure some funding for BIML. Right now, we've just been doing this for fun on our own nickel. Um, and uh, if we secure some funding 
for that, then we can have more guests participate, maybe even produce, I'd like to produce a lecture series the, of videos on um, security of machine learning so that people at the edge of security can learn what's going on in machine learning security because we are at the very, very beginning of this field. Um, you know, the fact that four people in Berryville can get together and make progress that the world is recognizing as important tells you something. You know, it doesn't take hundreds of millions of dollars to do really good work in machine learning security right now. This field is going to grow fast and it's going to expand rapidly. We read three or four papers a week and we talk about them and keeping up with the edge even for us that are kind of at it, um, is non-trivial. So, um, you know, and the field is just gonna grow as we start putting machine learning into more and more of our systems. And then it starts to be attacked by bad people. So, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, definitely get in touch. Um, we're talking to people all the time on the net. Lots and lots of people have read our work and they ask us questions about it. And we think it's very important to share as widely and openly as possible. So we're publishing in some peer reviewed journals and magazines. We've, ha we've had some articles in IEEE computer recently. Um, and we're intending to do uh, that sort of get out the word work as well as continue to push our own research agenda. Our hope is that our ideas will make a tangible difference in machine learning security and companies like Google and Microsoft and Amazon that are doing their own work in machine learning security will take advantage of and borrow our ideas to make machine learning more secure for everyone. Great, thank you for a great talk. Uh, we have no other questions posted. So I'd like to thank you and Dave. You bet. Thank you very much, Melissa, for, for uh, facilitating. Gary, thanks for those remarks. It's it's. It seems a little bit reminiscent of the internet itself, right? We created, we, we, you know, people created this thing and then and then now we've spent the last 30 or 40 years trying to go back and, and fix the things we did wrong sort of at the onset. And now we're in a little bit of a similar situation in the machine learning space. Exactly, you know, if you think about the theory of computer science, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, it's the same problem. So we build a universal computer and then we get really mad when it computes some stuff <laughs> don't want it to compute. <laughs> yeah, we I mean, it really, uh, the, the, you, you talked about, why does it even compute that in the first place? Yeah, I mean, you talked about the top five, and those top five were all sort of, seemed like they're all sort of intentionally adversarial things. But I, th I think, you know, a bigger concern to me is you have this combination of, of biases, which are things that we don't necessarily understand even in ourselves. And then at the same time, you have these machine learning systems that, that we don't, both of these things you mentioned, right? Machine learning systems that we don't really understand why they give the output that they give. And, yes. and you get the combination of those two things. Um, I don't know, that, 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 and that's nobody trying to do anything wrong. That's just sort of the, the, the unintended uh, outcomes of, of these systems. That's right. I mean, you might call it interesting times. I don't know. <laughs> awesome, very good. Well, thank you very much, Gary. This is, this is great stuff and, and uh, hopefully some folks reach out and, and uh, get some more information. I think it's, it's my uh, pleasure. So thanks for participating, everybody. 